So um, just a reminder to everybody what we're doing. We're attempting to reconcile the wish list, legislative wish list of the two bargaining sides in the, in the, uh, the commission that we created in Act 11. Um, we, we did hear from uh, Joe a while back and he gave us a number of things to consider. We asked Jeff and uh, Mr. O'Dell to try to put their heads together and see what could be mutually agreed upon. Are you starting with mutual agreement, Joe, or? Um, the way we had contemplated doing this is that Neil would go first and he would speak to the areas of agreement and the areas of uh, potential agreement, conceptual agreement. Yeah. And uh, then I was going to speak to the, in part, to the leftover issues, the ones where we could not reach agreement on Friday. Yeah. I was present with uh, Jeff and his his group and Neil and Sue on Friday. So we had a respectful meeting. Uh, we agreed on several points. There are others that we didn't reach agreement on. Okay, so we'll we'll assume that after you finish, we're coming forward with that core of um, potential agreement. So why don't you pick up with um, what you think was important that wasn't in that? Thank you. Uh, so I'm Joe McNeil. I was the chief negotiator and counsel to the employer commissioners in the uh, last round of uh, health care negotiations, mediation, fact-finding, and arbitration. And as I indicated, uh, uh, Neil O'Dell is going to speak to some areas of the agreement that we reached with uh, Jeff and company and uh, some areas of, of continuing disagreement, and I uh, will speak to the rest. So thank you for having me once again. I uh, appreciate the respectful attention. And uh, I would like to speak to paragraphs uh, 5, 7, 8, and 9 of um, the testimony that Mr. O'Dell um, introduced uh, to you on January 24th. That's this, everybody. So, um, with regard to uh, uh, paragraph 5, this is um, the uh, this, the scope of bargaining uh, we, be th we believe that there should be a statewide uh, grievance procedure. And we believe that that is important uh, through the commission in order to, number one, deal with interpretation issues which will inevitably arise over the results of our process, and number two, potentially enforcement uh, issues just in case uh, there are those that decide that contrary to the law, they're not going to follow uh, the mandate of the law. So we believe that having a system-wide, if you will, arbitration uh, system is really important, and we believe that without it, the likelihood is uh, that by handling grievances in the various districts, conflicting decisions will develop. Uh, overlapping or underlapping uh, decisions will result. And uh, the net effect will be confusion. Uh, our hope is to avoid that. So that is point number one. Point number two, uh, which seems in both when I testified uh, uh, previously, and as the Mr. O'Dell's uh, testimony was reported to me, um, it, it relates to number seven, and that is the constitution of the panel going forward. Um, it seemed uh, that this is one area where we were confusing the committee, all of us, better than helping the committee. Uh, so I'm taking a second stab at it. Uh, and 
the reason we're requesting a three uh, member panel is that we think that that gives the best opportunity for a good hearing process. And, the and best Joe, I'm sorry, before we go to what your recommendation is, can you just um, summarize for us what an existing yes, statute is? Yes, happy to. Um, the current statute indicates that the um, if, if you get to last best offer, uh, you go through mediation, one person, go to back finding, one person, and uh, you get the last best offer. The, um, the statute indicates that unless the parties can agree on a single arbitrator, which in the end we did this time around, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, unless the parties could agree, three, uh, there will be a three-person panel but appointed through the triple the American Arbitration Association. All three. All three of them. Yeah. And our, our concern is that that triples the cost uh, potentially for no uh, legitimate uh, uh, result. And so by analogy, we would recommend that you give consideration instead to the process that's outlined for fact finding in the current Teachers Act. And that's found at uh, 16 BSA 2007 B and C. And what that, what that indicates is that uh, both parties appoint a panel member, and they attempt to agree on a chair. And if, but if they can't agree, then the process involves uh, selection through the AAA process. But the, the, one, the one person as the chair is the AAA appointee. The benefit of it, uh, and both the Vermont NEA and school boards have used it uh, extensively, the benefit of it is that the panelists, one representative from each party, post the hearing, get one last opportunity to speak to and, and uh, hopefully convince the neutral, the third, the chair, that uh, their side is the more correct side. Um, ultimately, the chair's vote is controlling, uh, and that's fine. Uh, but this process, uh, with one appointee by each, and then the, the third party working as a chair, has worked, uh, and we think it will save expense uh, and be a better process in the end. So these these people would not be necessarily arbitrators. They could be anybody. They could be, yes, they could be. Uh, typically, the parties historically have appointed people that are familiar with the process, familiar with the system, familiar with the argument, so that they can be effective in the, in the caucus or the deliberative session yeah. with the but they would not have to be. And as we, as we presented testimony the first time around, we indicated that we would prefer that the two reps be Vermonters. The committee uh, reaction was not overwhelmingly uh, in favor of that specification. We didn't perceive. So we thought about it further, and we're not wed to that. Okay. Uh, that's not the end of the day. If we can, if we can both uh, make an appointment, uh, so we recommend that uh, as uh, something to be considered for an alternative to the current system. Question: I'm trying to remember what problem you're trying to solve with this. Was it? I recall a conversation about the arbitrator not. I think I referred to arbitrator is lame. So that, those are my words. But um, <laughs> is that the problem you're trying to do, that the arbitrator didn't in, provide in, the explanation part, and that? In part, we believe that it is more likely to be the case that if you have a three-person panel uh, with the chair, the, the parties will urge upon the arbitrator a more, let's call it a more robust uh, decision-making process than what we had. Okay. And time. how will it save money? It will save money because the current statute says that if we're going to use a panel, 
Uh -huh. All three of them have to be from the AAA. Oh, okay. So that means you're paying the AAA administrative fee and you're paying the per diem cost for all three. It also means more likely than not that all three are not from Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, and you didn't do that route this time. You didn't we have did, a panel. We did right? not. Okay. We did. They agreed not. on one arbitrator. One arbitrator. We, we agreed on one arbitrator. Okay. Sure. Um, and that, uh, that moves me to paragraph, paragraph A, uh, particularly B and C, uh, which talk about uh, the, the results of or what should be included in the analysis. And very frankly, the more important uh, of these subsections to us is subsection C, uh, which uh, we would require that the, the arbitrator um, uh, provide in the decision uh, a, a, an analysis of the cost of the proposals by both parties uh, and uh, in selecting one indicate with some degree of specificity why uh, that uh, particular proposal is being accepted as opposed to the other. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do recognize we also asked for uh, in B an actuarial uh, valuation and the impact upon uh, the uh, uh, education spending. I'd be the first to confess that that may be a bit daunting for uh, for an arbitrator uh, without fairly extensive expert testimony. Um, and so of the two, C is the more important to us. Uh, and just making sure that we have a developed, fully reasoned um, uh, decision. And we don't think we don't think it's too much to ask that that occur. And Joe, just um, jog my memory, if you would. I know that um, Mr. Odell had talked about the need for uh, standard rationale to come back, as opposed to what we got this time around. So this would be a part of that. It would be in the that, final report. So that's cor that's you want correct. Rationale and full cost of the estimate. That that's correct, Mr. Chair. I, I'm, what do you mean by a full cost estimate on the on the a statewide cost estimate? Yes. On the impact on the education fund, or an impact, or just a, this would cost fair, a, a million a fair, bucks. A, or a, what? Fair, a fair question. Uh, ultimately, to, to the commission, the way the case was tried, we would have been satisfied. Uh, frankly, if the arbitrator had said, based on the evidence, um, the, the employer commissioners say that the employee commissioner's plan is $25 million more expensive. They say it isn't. I find, in finding for X or Y, I find that the cost is likely to be. So, overall cost on a statewide basis would be um, at least a minimum, and we could live with that, very frankly. Do, do arbitrators have those skills? Uh, they do if the evidence is presented to them. What we had in this situation, not to dwell on it, but we had three very long days of hearing in the last best offer proceeding. We both had experts both healthcare experts and, and fiscal analysts. And information, evidence was presented as to cost. Uh, and in the, what we believe is the typical arbitration, typical proceeding that we've had for the state of Vermont, for example, before the BLRB, you get a detailed decision that says, here, here are the positions of the parties, here are the facts that we find. Here are our conclusions of law with regard to those facts. And consequently, here is the decision that we're making. 
as we presented last time, this decision said simply, I looked at both parties' positions, theirs is closer to the statute, whatever that meant. They win. Okay, they won. Um, I get that. And some will win, some will lose. But I think what we're really hoping to gain from the committee here is language suggesting, demanding that we get more for our uh, more out of uh, these uh, processes. Um, so the and and paragraph nine is really a continuation of that. Um, the um, we would we would like in the ideal world for the legislature to indicate what this statute is all about. We know it's about um, uh, greater equity among educational employees. Is uh, we, we assume it's about providing a level of access uh, through educational employers that didn't exist before. But is it within, within the realm of reasonable cost, or is it at any cost? Uh, and we think that, uh, that, that an articulation that it is within a uh, reasonable cost does not tilt the scales uh, uh, in favor of one side or the other. It just uh, demands a certain amount of balancing. And that's what that's what we're looking for. And and then then the last one and perhaps the the toughest in in terms of where we go from here, the the Vermont NEA has requested uh, in its in uh, the S two two six as uh, introduced that we move from what I would call. Uh, the baseball arbitration model, last best offer, to a Solomon model, you know, uh, pick, uh, pick and choose among the positions. And we'd be the first to say that the, uh, the arbitrator in the proceeding we just went through indicated that if he had uh, his uh, the power to do so, he would not have picked one in its entirety but would have picked and chosen mm -hmm. among the competing proposals. So we have thought and really anguished uh, the employer commissioners over whether to support or not support the NEA proposal that we moved from last best offer to Solomon offer. There, there are wis there's wisdom in both approaches, and no doubt about it. But on at the end of the day, we would favor the retention of the last best offer uh, approach. And the reason for that, although it didn't work this time, uh, the reason for that is that we believe that over time, that will serve as a better deterrent mm -hmm. uh, against getting to uh, arbitration as the final step and will serve as a catalyst towards uh, the parties reaching the settlement. Yeah. It's, um, I can't tell you that that's a scientific conclusion based upon you know, years of study, uh, uh, but I do know from experience elsewhere that the fact that the arbitrator is going to have to pick one uh, proposal in its entirety versus another is is a driver towards settlement. And, and, I, and I know from experience on behalf of the state in executive branch bargaining that there were two or three occasions when the Vermont Labor Relations Board, in its opinion, said, but for this one, this one thing, we would have gone with the other party's uh, proposal. But because of this one thing that we can't abide, we're going to you know, pick door number A. Uh, our thinking is that that deterrent is a better part of our jurisprudence than the than going issue by issue. So uh, that's my supplemental testimony today. 
I'm happy to answer any questions. And ultimately, uh, we're mindful of the, the chair's um, uh, indication that it would be helpful to actually have drafted language. Yep. Uh, once the committee decides uh, where it wants to go. Or this, this is actually fine. This is prescriptive enough that Jim could easily okay. convert it. And um, if there's any help we can give, we're happy to. I'm just wondering if there's data from just collective bargaining writ large about the, the, the evidence between last best offer and the sort of menu uh, option. Be, because it, it, I don't know. I mean, I can't tell which the logic would, would lead to in terms of which is more likely to lead to arbitration or not. Well, I think the I think the problem with it is that it's not just which outcome you got, but, but which was more valuable. So um, one of the things I don't like about the pick and choose model is that you could have an arbitrator fashion an agreement that neither side likes. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, would, that piece of data wouldn't help you to, to know whether or not it led to arbitration because the important thing for me is how the parties are looking at it and responding to it. If, does that make sense? Yes, so, I mean, yeah, but I think that's a, a slightly different question mm -hmm. because I mean, if, if your argument is that you want to do the last best, best offer because you think it will lead to fewer cases of arbitration, notwithstanding what just happened, um, do you, is that just a hunch, or do you do you have actual data that shows that that's more likely? It's a, it's a great question. Let me try to handle it by the, the experience that I've encountered. Um, city, uh, for about 40 years or so, I represented the city of Burlington, and I did all their bargaining. Uh, back in the 1970s, under the statutory authority, the voters in Burlington passed uh, a referendum that said that uh, in order to eliminate the possibility of strikes, not on the teacher side, but on the municipal side, uh, they would uh, adopt uh, binding arbitration as the last step of the, of the process. So that, that has been uh, with the city of Burlington for that length of time. Um, it is not last best offer, to be fair. It, it doesn't speak to whether uh, sometimes the parties have agreed to make it last best offer, other time it's gone issue by issue. There has been a deter there is a deterrent effect to both methodologies. The, there have only been about in 40 years, I think four or five situations where binding arbitration has been used. A couple in the electric department relating to pensions, and uh, one in police and one in fire, as I remember. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the state of Vermont uh, executive branch and judiciary, um, the judi judiciary hasn't used it, but the um, state of Vermont executive branch has a statute that has last best offer no picking and choosing. Um, and in the history of the state of Vermont bargaining, it's been used only twice. Um, so it has acted as a deterrent. I'm probably working my, around, uh, my way around to say, I don't think it's just a hunch, uh, but uh, but it's still anecdotal. It, it is. Yeah. Uh, the only other thing I would say is that I can't cite you to chapter and verse, but I'm, I am familiar, I have read several scholarly articles that suggest that if you're going to have uh, arbitration, uh, interest arbitration as opposed to grievance arbitration, and you want instead to have an incentive to settlement, last best offer is the better approach. And but I, it, avoiding arbitration is only one thing that we're thinking about. It's also mm -hmm. what, what will the results of arbitration be? And people have different theories about which method is, is going to, even if we go to arbitration, which method is going to produce the best result. Um, and 
you know, I wouldn't say it's impervious to data, but it's very much driven by people's values and um, what they want out of the process, which is contested heavily anyway. So, um, so um, Joe, I know you have to go to GovOps. You're 10 minutes past your um, stated time. Do they need you or? I was supposed to get a text from Pat Gable when uh, if, if you when can had to be there. stay, that's great. Um, we can bring up Neil Adele. And I have to go. Okay. <laughs> I will come back. All right. Good enough. Thank you very much for your courtesy. Absolutely. And thanks for um, showing us where agreement does not exist. <laughs> so hopefully now we're, we're headed into down into the happy valley of Mutual agreement. Count on me to keep the controversy going. <laughs> okay. And Neil Adele, Vice President, School Board Association. Uh, president, actually. Oh, okay. Vice President, Vice President. Vice President. Vice President of last year. I do have new. And then also attached is the testimony from. Uh, the last time for, for reference to just the, the way that I go through this. Is, uh, so uh, once again, thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to come in and speak with you again today. Um, at your request, the BSDA and the Vermont NEA uh, representatives from both organizations met this past Friday to determine areas of agreement and disagreement, it was a respectful discussion. On the basis of that meeting, I am happy to report that we did find agreement on a few items. Very good. Uh, we both support, and then here, this is where the testimony from last time might come into handy. We both support paragraph one of the DSBA proposal for specific additions to uh, S226, except for my testimony back on January 24th relating to expanding the definition of employees covered by Act 11, uh, treating supervisory and managerial employees as teachers slash administrators. Sorry, Mr. Uh, Odell, so, one second. Okay. Um, you have a copy of this, Jim, or no? Oh. Uh, Jeannie, can I take that copy? That, uh, I, I, I got one now. You got one? Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, so obviously, we're very interested in these points of agreement for our potential additions. Okay. Sure. Um, so that was treating supervisory and managerial employees as teachers and administrators, and treating non-supervisory confidential employees as support staff. We also agreed on paragraph 4F relating to per diems and expense reimbursement for the commissioners, and paragraph 8A relating to clarifying a requirement that last best offer positions be submitted and exchanged before the arbitration hearing and that the party shall not be permitted to modify their last best offers post hearing. Okay, those all seem very sensible. Wait, which one, I'm sorry, what was the last one? I the last one was 8A. 8A, okay. And that was about last best offers and not modifying them after the hearing. Okay. Um, additionally, uh, Vermont NEA stated that it agreed in concept with our proposed paragraph three relating to the exclusion of alternates uh, with the possibility of limiting the number of alternates on each side. Paragraph 4D relating to striking the provision about removal of commissioners for cause is unnecessary. And then paragraph 10 relating to providing funding for expenses such as court reporters, common research, the arbitration. You mean state funding? Correct. Yeah, OK. Right. So 4D was agreed to. In, so these are in concept. I would say that I, we didn't necessarily, the Vermont NEA did not say yes. Yeah. The, the response was in concept. We agreed to these things. I think there was some further okay. thought and discussion. And we could, to occur. William Smith, potentially yeah. find something on both sides. I can't speak for the MIA, but I okay. for BSDA, I would say yes. Sounds good. I'm sorry, so you got the last is The last one Paragraph was... 10. No, oh, paragraph related 10. To, related to the funding. What is paragraph 5? It's, it's uh, the fourth paragraph down from the top. Uh, five. On the first page. Yeah. Paragraph 
compensation for commissioners? Oh, no, I, 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 I thought you were uh, looking on today's testimony. I was looking yeah. at your you're referencing your old testimony, yeah, correct. right? In yeah. terms of our yeah. okay. numbers. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Keep going. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, while their position on Friday was not supported, the NEA representatives indicated that they appreciated our explanations and were willing to give further thought to paragraph five relating to adding a statewide grievance procedure and paragraph six relating to starting our next round of bargaining earlier. Uh, the BSBA is hopeful that further thought will result in support. <laughs> That's, that also seems kind of a no-brainer to me than starting bargaining earlier. I mean, unless there's some, uh, you know, reason related to the timing of the academic calendar or something. Um, I think everybody agreed it was a very tight timeline. Yeah, and I'll, uh, I have a little bit more on that a little bit later in the testimony. Okay. But yeah, the, the timeline was, was certainly not ideal for school boards. Mm -hmm. um, so for those paragraphs we were, where we were unable to agree, the BSBA continues to support all of the proposed changes from our original testimony of January 24th. Um, my remaining testimony today will focus on those items more directly impacting local boards. Uh, you heard previously from the other one of the items that I think were more specific to the action commission. With respect to paragraph two, uh, we suggest that the employee commissioners include at least one administrator uh, because they're clearly obligated by the statute to represent this category of covered employees, which had no representational voice in the first round of bargaining. Uh, we respectfully suggest that they cannot be among the employer commissioners because they would uh, have a very apparent conflict of interest here. Uh, moving on, striking paragraph 4H did not elicit a strong objection from Vermont NEA. Uh, merely a thought that doing so would be premature at this juncture. Uh, the SBA sees no likelihood that the commission will ever need to be involved in rulemaking, so we suggest that this provision would simply sit as a, a dead letter if it, um, if it is retained. Um, well, Mr. McNeil um, did cover this provision. Um, I would also like to point out that with respect to paragraph 8C, and 16 BSA 2105 D4, requiring the arbitrator to include what he or she believes to be the cost of implementation of his or her award based upon the evidence presented at the hearing um, really is a critical piece of information for school boards to know in preparing their own budgets. Having that cost information would really be quite helpful to us. Um, I am uh, disappointed that we weren't able to come to an agreement regarding the timing of negotiations as we proposed in paragraph six and that the Vermont NEA's proposal number three for negotiations data from school districts by February 1st. The, the VSBA agrees that accurate and timely negotiations data from school districts is beneficial for both the employee and the employer commissioners. Uh, we also feel that school districts would be more than able to meet the request if it falls outside of the normal budget development season. Um, our request to change the timeline of negotiations will allow for school districts boards and the local Vermont NEA bargaining units to have accurate and final information regarding employee health insurance important to local bargaining and budget development, a more reliable tax rate estimate since the settlement can be incorporated into the tax commissioner's December 1st letter, and finally a greater opportunity for local bargaining to complete in time for inclusion in the budget or at the very least to be able to be presented at town meeting. Um, Regarding the original language of S226, we're still opposed to Section 2. Um, one of the original premises of Act 11 was to move towards equal access at equal contribution levels for educational employees. The change requested here would alter the school fundamentals and use a suspect methodology for doing so. Looking at salary only would not accurately reflect an employee's ability to pay. And additionally, as Jeff Francis has pointed out in his testimony, many school employees work a varying number of days each year. Using salary as a measurement of ability to pay would be further complicated by the number of contracted work days for that salary. So um, if I could just check on a nuance. Yeah. So I, I think you're right that NEA would like to have that change made, but there's, a, there's another step that could be taken, which is just to allow it to be bargained. 
um, which wouldn't make the change, but it would allow it to be bargained and under certain circumstances where both sides agreed, it could become a change. Um, am I assuming right that you oppose both of those scenarios? You assume correctly, yeah. Okay. I mean, it just, it, you know, if it were to be bargained and then therefore as a result it were to be allowed, um, that's yet another administrative burden on our folks. We're already assuming all of the administrative fees associated with managing these plans. Now we've got to also worry about varying levels of premium share depending on the employee and their salary levels. So mm -hmm. uh, not in favor of it at this point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then finally, I'd also we still have continuing concerns about the high court representation, yeah. um, but would love the opportunity to talk about that in the future days. Well, honestly, so do I. Um, you know, it was clear just from trying to schedule a basic testimony that it was um, not a high functioning group. Um, you know, my I guess my hope is that growing pains and we get to a place where the group becomes more comfortable and trusting of one another. Uh, but un understood that going forward, he'd be, be interested in taking a look at that. Questions for Mr. O'Dell? Well, thank you. That's, um, I thought that was very helpful. That first page has what looks like five areas of potential agreement. Three may be right away, and then a couple that we might be able to get to. So why don't we ask um, Jeff to come up and hear his take. Good afternoon. Uh, for the record, Jeff Bannon from Vermont VA. Um, as Neil and, and Joe did talk about, we did meet with uh, Sue and Neil was on the phone and Joe in person, and uh, I, Don Tinney, and Colin all met um, Friday afternoon and tried to go through this and uh, figure out where we had agreement and disagreement. Mm -hmm. And I think they presented largely, truthfully, I might mean, I mean, take some uh, liberties with how they describe it. I think it's fine, mm -hmm. in large measure. And I, I saw not, they had nine paragraphs, and I think we agreed to three. <laughs> as my scorekeeping on Friday. Mm -hmm. um, large, I think you just echoed that uh, as well. So I think that it's true. Um, the alternates, I'm not sure exactly how Neil just described it. Um, I think what we said on Friday was we think that it's about the alternates to the, to the commission. We thought that um, we are looking forward to an unlimited number, if you will, you know, unlimited, but you know, a large number. And I think the committee discussed two, up to two, and we were, uh, what we were saying on Friday was, that, you know, okay, we, we had a little bit two, we could live with two, that's what we were generally saying. I mean, it make, makes sense to me, but the committee hasn't taken a position on it yet. I do think unlimited immediately proved problematic, and you can understand why. Right. Senator Pershing. Is it a question of the number, or, or if they're present at the negotiations? Or well, we see the alternates as being present at the negotiations, and here's why. Um, and I think I, I talked about this last time. We, when we started asking folks to participate as we prepared for this bargaining, somebody who we thought would have been a very good uh, sports staff person um, almost immediately took another job and was not able to participate. And we realized then, in August of 2018, that Life is what it is. People participate and then things change six months down the road or whatever. And I remember having a conversation with Nicole about that in September of that year, saying, suggesting that alternates might be a good thing for both sides because if you want the process to continue on, you need people who are knowledgeable about what happened previously. And so we thought it would be important just to be able to slip people in. Mm -hmm. So we see the alternates as actually, as an perspective, as being necessary to be in the room to carry out the function, so much like a juror, as we yeah. described earlier, it will step in should they, somebody else have to step off. Yeah, so you're, you're current on the testimony and the data and all of that stuff. Yes. Somebody has to step out if you just change chairs in the room. Um, the, the, it seemed to me that the big objection, going back to the start of the process, was the number, which was five, and then five NEA commissioners who were officially supposed to be there. That's, a, a team of 10 in the room, which can be a little intimidating. Here, each side would be theoretically allowed seven people in the room, two of whom would be sitting and listening, but not present and voting. Um, 
So we're close. Good, good to know that that's a potential area of agreement too. Right. Um, and and um, there are a couple other, I think Neil, Neil mentioned too, on paragraphs uh, 4D of their document and 5. We think there are some necessary, I think you alluded to it, uh, Mr. Chair, the, uh, the need for wording, word smithing. The details matter in those, and I think the concept could probably agree to them, but uh, the words matter. Mm -hmm. Some flushing out of those words needs to happen. So would, would you be averse to um, me sitting down with Jim and working on a drafting request that incorporates those that you haven't fully agreed on um, so that there was language for you to react to that? Yeah, I mean, I think that particularly about the grievance one, the statewide grievance, I think that's a really important uh, concept. And, and I think that um, the details really very much okay. do matter. And somebody's got to be knowledgeable about what those details are and, and how they might play out in reality. So I think that's a really delicate one for us, but I think it. And, and uh, before you left, Joe offered to draft language. You could do the same on the grievance right. thing, and we could look at both drafts and figure out um, what we want to do with it. But knowing that you want to go in the same direction is um, really useful. Right. Um, go around. It, you know, they were. Um, they shared with us and they shared with you earlier. Uh, 8C was a bit of big interest to them. And um, and this is what the parties did, frankly. Uh, they had a, a financial health care expert in the form of Steve May. Uh, we had a financial expert in the form of Steve Capel, who used to work at JFO. Um, and they were the ones costing out the proposals. And the arbitrator heard from both sides. Mm -hmm. um, the two Steves, if you will, got together and I think you know came to some common understandings about certain things as they progress. Um, and so I think that their cost estimate um, is a significant challenge for the arbitrator. He or she, going forward, might have to pick one side or the other, um, in some sense of the word, and rely on that party's expert who testified at the hearing. I don't, you know, Joe admitted that it, it would be significant uh, a significant lift for the arbitrator might have to hire an actuary to go through it on him or herself, you know, to give them their own estimate. Not to mention the least of which is what we call a take-up rate. Nobody knows whether somebody's going to take a single person plan this year and a family next year. They might get married. They might get divorced and go the other way. They might have a kid. Um, all life events happen, and to estimate uh, how this is going to play out and cost-wise is, I think, an impossibility. What the cost is really what we're dealing with here is people know they're going to pay 80 20. People know that their out of pockets are $400 if they have a single plan, or $800 if they have a family plan. Those are the cost estimates. Now, whether people take up a family plan or just stay with a single, that's what they really want to know here. I think that's next to impossible for an arbitrator to do. Um, so I think that's really uh, something that's challenging. And I did, that's why we've said no so far. It is um, next to a possibility. And both sides have done it, if you will. They bring their actuaries, make the argument, and the arbitrator makes a decision. And finds one more. Uh, and that's what the arbitrator did here. Yeah. Uh, hamstrung, if you will, by time. Selected one and moved on. So um, just trying to, again, figure areas of agreement. So you do not agree about adding cost estimate to the arbitrator's report. But am I remembering right that you agreed that a more fulsome explanation of why one package was picked over the other is something? I, I, I certainly a, a, a more complete written decision yeah. would have, might help everybody. But I, I think it was alluded to last time we testified that could have been the party's contract with the arbitrator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, we went back to the arbitrator for clarification, and he rendered a second you know, clarifying decision. So it's not as if uh, the parties don't have tools yep. available to them already. Although it wouldn't hurt to put it in the statute that um, you know the arbitrator shall um, select the last best offer, assuming we stay with that, and provide a you know reasonable rationale for doing so. You know, I've not spoken with the arbitrator in this case, Alan McAllison. I, I would hazard a guess that he might say that he did. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, he selected and said, uh, 
the school employee's position. I forget the exact word. It was if right. I remember right, he said it would take a long time, so I'm not going to do it, um, <coughs> which is, I, I don't think the reason that it met the statute. It met the statute. Well, it, was, it, was, it was fairly short, no question right. about it. So we'll just, you know, we could look at another sentence in terms of fleshing out what, what the expectation is coming back from the, the arbitrator. Are the cost estimates required in the last best offer, or is the process is such that you would never get to that stage without a cost estimate? Well, well certainly both sides had actuary, you know, financial experts there to uh, attempt to assert their side of the version of why it was less costly or more costly or whatever the case may be. So that was part of the, the conversation, absolutely. Right. Uh, was, was there a value in saying you have to do that, or is it just not always going to be? Necessarily will be part and parcel to the party's conversation. Cost is, is significant and, and understandable and, and uh, part of the conversation. Well, and, and you know, frankly, in the in the school board's proposals, there's a running theme of wanting to um, raise the, the visibility of cost to the state to the district um, in in the statute. So there's another area that you didn't agree on where they wanted to add language around um, what it would cost the state, or could it be afforded? Um, and those were not in your areas of agreement, so I'm assuming. So when you're a seller, for example, that's not, that's not permissible in the state employees yeah. labor relations law. Um, and Joe and I talked about that on Friday. You know, already in state law, for state employees, excuse me, um, it's not part of the allowable discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay. So being consistent, if, if you will, with seller in this regard, that's what we were thinking. Jeff, can I ask you, in terms of striking subsection A of section B, or no, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, subsection A of section H23 of Act 11. Um, Legislative intent at H23. Yeah, do you? Do you uh, we, we feel very strongly that it's stay there. It's, it's, it's a, it, that, and here's why. Just for a historical reference, it's there. It's how, it, it is what guided the parties to some degree or another last year. Mm -hmm. um, it is not, it is not, uh, and we had this discussion on Friday, it doesn't have any influence going forward. Uh, the language by its own terms expires. It's in session law. It's not codified yeah. in the Green Books. Yeah. It, and so it is not, uh, other than historical reference, which is we think is important for it to stay there for that very reason, it has no lasting effect going okay. forward. It's session law. But you think it might be um, guidance of some sort? As I think if somebody were to look back, it's what guided last year's conversation. It doesn't, mm -hmm. I, I think removing it from session law is a little bit odd to me, frankly, if, you, if you're going to look at, I mean, session law is insider baseball anyway. Yeah. Right? I mean, most people look at the green books and see, look to see what's codified. If you know that there's session law out there, and then to think, oh, we can change session law after the fact, um, it just. It, which, which language specifically are you talking about? So, legislative intent here. Uh -huh. um, this, so in, last, in, in 2018, when the, when the law was passed, there was um, an understanding that merging support staff and, and licensed folks, mm -hmm. they were, support staff particularly were all over the map uh, uh, as to what they were paying in health insurance. And so there was an, an appreciation for that mm -hmm. and allowing the parties in the one time, the first contract only, to allow for different um, payment amounts for both sides. Mm -hmm. And that's why that, that was in there. It's, it was a, it was a one-time only it's just, And it's allowance. just in session law? It is just in session law. Yeah, I, I don't know how ledge council would treat it, but I mean, I guess if you were to put in another session law, delete session law, Act 11, paragraph H23, whatever it is, um, but it would be tortured in some sense of the logic of it. I, I don't know. Yeah, and, and you know, to the extent that it does exist as regular <coughs> legislative intent, the intent is pretty broad, and you know I don't think it would really help the arbitrator one way or the other. So I, I don't think it advantages one side or the other. And by its own terms, it's it's expired. Right. Right. So an arbitrator, I think, would be ill-advised to look at it. 
yeah. expired language to try to influence his or her decision down the road. So I'll turn to our uh, four items that we received. Um, and I, you know, as to section one uh, in section S226, um, to, to attend the time off, I mean, that they're, again, it's a cost estimate that they were looking for a cost to, to substitute users. Um, and I'm not sure, what I, my notes here from Friday were that VSB is really not sure how this will play out. Um, so I don't know if we have agreement or not on that entirely, but I think in concept, I think everybody uh, thought it was it made sense to say it that way. There's the cost factor that they're concerned about, and I understand that. Um, uh, do you know how many of the employees or commissioners were granted that month? Like, was at it least one that I was aware of. I know that um, it was denied the ability, and, and then I think I, frankly, Suzanne from my office and Joe had to get involved and, and uh, rest of the person out or at the classroom to attend the parking session. And it just seems uh, it's a challenge for both sides. Mm -hmm. People aren't able to get there. So you've agreed on something weeks or a month in advance, and also that you can't later. It seems uh, not, uh, not a good process. So we think they ought to be allowed um, <clears throat> out. And that's why we, we put it in. Thought it was important to me. Yeah. Jeff, um, I have. I just thought of this. Maybe it's a bad idea. Mm -hmm. What would you think in, in that case of an accounting of the sub cost and then split by the two sides? I guess in, in, you know, that's sort of what paragraph ten above is talking about. Okay. <coughs> um, their paragraph ten. The, the compensation, I and mean, we think they should be compensated. That's what we agree. Uh, and I guess you get folded into that concept as well. Uh, do you mean by the state? Well, they, that's what they were seeking. Uh, we do think that the commissioner should be compensated, um, and we did agree with them on the overall I, I, paragraph 10. Because I honest, honestly, I can't imagine that that goes anywhere. Um, I know both sides would agree that it would be great if the state would pick up the cost, um, but I'm remembering the discussions I had with uh, Senator Kitchell when we were doing this. So. I am aware of the political rounds, yes. Yeah. Did it get into the budget adjustment that they get paid for last time? She didn't mention it the other day, but maybe it was too small. <clears throat> I'll ask. I and, and we would support that. I mean, if they mm -hmm. you had it in Act 11, yeah. they relied on it. I think that's only fair. Yeah, yeah. We support them on that. As to Section 2, um, this is what allowing different uh, different premium co-pays based on one's ability to pay. We, we feel very strongly about this. We do think that uh, under Melra, Chitton and East, and Middlebury already do it, Melra being the municipal employees law. Um, so it's done in schools already, at least two. Under the state police, Celera, it's done there at the state colleges and at UBM. And uh, so it, it's a concept that's, that's done elsewhere in a collectively bargained environment. Mm -hmm. um, and we just think it, it makes inherent practical sense given that the salaries and, and, and income of school employees varies dramatically from um, particularly unlicensed people. And that's uh, what we're particularly looking for. The teachers are a little bit closer <coughs> together, but also new teachers in particular have significant student loans. We think there, there could be some concept, you know, if you're, you're the newer teachers who have the student loans, they're at the lower end of it, and they have to be, you know, able to pay their bills and student loans as well as get health care. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want people not taking health care because they can afford it. That's the issue. Right. Um, <clears throat> and the last two, VSBA just, uh, you know, we had fundamental disagreement on data. We think data is very important. I think, uh, I think they agree in concept that data is very important. We, we share, uh, we hire somebody independently, VSBA, and we did. We think data is paramount. If you're going to get good information, a good decision from an arbitrator. She must have good information going in. Both sides must have it. So I think data is really important. Um, and uh, the last best offer that the, you know, maybe it was tougher the first go around, but after the first round, uh, Joe's right in the state system. There have been decisions where the arbitrator, the, the decision maker, would have appreciated, um, would have decided one way or another 
but based on one or two provisions that may have been unlawful, in my opinion, they couldn't decide there. So that this is a design. This our process here is designed to reach a more rational decision overall, and not have potentially wild swings with people swinging for the fence, mm -hmm. if you will. And I think that's the challenge. Uh, it is not clean and cut. Where, where do you stand on the the changing the timeline? You are not in favor of We're not in favor of it right why, now. Why is that? And, and, um, it, a couple of things. It, it would, number one, selfishly, I think for both sides, it would mean this October we start bargaining. Mm -hmm. For, um, you have a vacation plan already? I don't. I wish I did, but I don't. <laughs> I'm a kid in college. <laughs> but just finished, you know. Yeah. And so we just finished, but I, so I don't think it's a good, healthy. I think there's some need. And honestly, so every contract in the state is up for bargaining right now. Mm -hmm. um, the school boards don't know what their overall costs are going to be. You know, on December 1, any more than they do on town meeting day, most contracts go expire June 30, and they go right up to that as well after town meeting day votes. And so the argument that they need to know it well in advance is simply not, it's, it's not today. It's been a history of not knowing what the actual costs are until well after town meeting day. Well, it kind of, I mean, have, having been through the budget process a bunch of times, it, it really sucks to have no information on which to put together a budget. And this would just be one more thing. And if we can align it so that school districts have more information to do their budget. I'm not sure. I, I don't hear. I don't hear a good argument from your side about why we should realign the timing to to be. Just because not everything else is. If I could realign everything to time better, it would be better. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it's the timing is um, tight regardless. Yeah. And it is going to be tight regardless. And I think just starting earlier is going to extend it even longer, the, the torment. I think the parties <laughs> I think the parties need to get to a decision. They need to come to an agreement uh, more quickly. We, the, this, we went to the, the very end, if you will. Right, but if we started it earlier and then put an earlier time de end date. It would be the same amount. It would be the same amount of time, just shifted earlier. Shifted earlier. Um, you know, I, I get it. I, what I'm saying is that, that uh, we're just going to push something else, and, and the timing is what it is. We are. We'll be bargaining then for information with on plans that people haven't even taken up yet. So you're bargaining years in advance, mm -hmm. and, and how long in advance do you want it? We won't have. We won't know what the cost of the health insurance is at that point. We have no idea. <clears throat> and so these new plans that we're talking about now mm -hmm. will start January one of twenty. 21, mm -hmm. and we'll start bargaining before we even know those plans and how they're playing out in October of this year uh, for January 1, 2023. We just think it's way too early. Well, what, what about the next year? I, what, I, I mean, that's maybe the, I'm just not clear about what the timeline is. What, you will start bargaining this October for two years in advance. Oh, that's, right. that's, their proposal. that's that's what they want. That's what their proposal. Uh, I see. We think I'm it's just way trying too to early. figure out how to realign it better with the school budgeting calendar. Yeah. Maybe it doesn't have to be two years in advance, when but just sort of shift. So we you know, so we'll we'll start under the current law. We'll start bargaining in April of 2021 for plans that will start January 1, essentially, 20. 2023. Okay. So you're you're suggesting what they're suggesting is starting bargaining of October of 2020 for plans to start January 1, 2023. Yeah, that does seem too far in advance. I just think it's way too far. In I, that, but I, I'm wondering if just move it up. That's a six yeah. month. Change. I mean, I understand the argument that you know if we had all the information in a perfect world um, for 2023. But we don't have salary information. We we, we right. the contracts aren't even settled yet. That expire this June 30 for the following right. year. So it's it. This is a concept that parties have lived with for many years. I mean, it's not as if no, uh, but it all is just yeah. No, I get it. I mean, if we had perfect information yeah. uh, three years in advance, and, and uh, we used to just so you know, we used to have longer term contracts that allowed for that. Mm -hmm. So you might 
you know, year one might be a little bit of a hiccup, but in years two and three and four, you just have four-year deals. They were common. Those are gone away for whatever reason. The parties aren't willing, to, uh, don't want to, I don't know. Um, but that would allow better budgeting. Yeah. Absolutely. We were looking for a four-year deal under this proposal. They wanted it too, and so we actually split the difference. We got eight, uh, two and a half is really what we have. The way it works out. Calendar. That's not splitting the difference. Well, I. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to make sure you understood the math. Right, right. <laughs> I get it. I, I get it. I mean, we it, uh, we were looking for a longer term deal that yeah. would have addressed their issue initially, and, and okay. uh, we think that's probably the parties can figure this out. If they want stability and knowledge moving forward, they can come to an agreement about that. I think that's really what we, we feel strongly about. So um, I said before, I, I think the, the easiest next step is for us to generate a draft out of what you've brought us today, have um, Jim put together an, a strike all for 226 that gets rid of the language that was not agreed upon, keeps the language that was agreed upon, and adds proposals from the school boards that were either agreed to or looked as though they were within striking distance. Then we can have uh, the two sides back. We can be working from that. At that point, you can uh, certainly make other arguments about what you, you might, without mutual agreement, still want to get in. Um, but it becomes it becomes a, a harder task to get it in because it's not mutually agreed, and it would it would take a majority of the committee to want to put one of those items right. in. Does that make sense? I think so. Is there anything else that you want us to know before we before we try to codify what you're um, tentatively agreeing to, and maybe some things that you close on? The, the only thing that struck me was that the very last point about the time where, where I thought, respectfully, Jeff used the same argument that I'm using as to why he didn't want to change the timeline is because he was worried about not getting accurate data for the commissioners. And I'm worried about not getting accurate data for school boards for, for budgeting. So um, I believe the argument <laughs> works for us both in a sense. Perhaps it does. But is it, are you asking for two years in advance instead of just one year in advance? I'm still not clear on the timing. Maybe I just need to look at a calendar with two of you. But. So this agreement, yeah, we could do that. But this agreement starts, the effective date is January 1, 2021, for two years. Right, so it ends in 2023. So the next time you're bargaining, bargaining would start on January 1, 2023. Yes? The next contract. The next yes. contract. And you're asking for bargaining to start in October of 2020. Correct? Uh, no, not 2020. Uh, the year before the contract would go into effect. So that would because be because if it takes them a year to bargain out a contract, right? It, the the October fifteenth date was merely one to put down there so that we'd have something to talk about. I think the I date think there's that a I'm year most percent. interested in is the, the the final arbitration hearing and then when the report would come out and to have that data in school board members' hands before budget season really kicks off. That's the important date for us. Right, and I th so I think you're still missing, you're missing a year. I think it can start in October of 2021. Correct, it would be the October of the year yes, before the year to the do it, it would be done October 22, going into effect three months later. I see, okay. Yes, they want to double. The, the current statute. Right. Uh, Sorry, I'm holding yeah. you all up. I'm just trying to get <laughs> Yeah. I get it. Right. Right. <laughs> we're, not, we're not tied to that October date. What we are tied to is making sure that the final Finish decision, it. the agreement, the award, <laughs> comes in time for, for board members. Well, then let's start it in July, which I know you will all love because everybody's up. But that's when you need it. You need to buy, but you need to buy September 1st. Start what in July? Bargaining. No, it starts early. We start in April. We start in April. Oh, I thought you started in October. Yeah. They want. I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna We're stop. talking about yeah. We might. Currently in statute, it's April first of the year um, prior to the expiration of the agreement. Mm -hmm. So the contract 
uh, that currently exists, the agreement expires on December 31st, 2022. Therefore, bargaining happens in 2021, mm -hmm. beginning April 1st, concluding December 15th, 2021, for a full year prior. So, uh, Colin Robinson, Ronnie, I think also one thing for the record is, you know, the first year of anything new is, is a bit of a level set, right? And um, I would, you know, I think we believe that and hope, A, future negotiations might not go to arbitration, right? Um, B, that um, obviously the changes that could come of any agreement may not be as impactful um, for employees or employers that are being felt this year in the first, um, the first agreement. It is. <laughs> well, I mean, we've gone through it once. I think that's right. Yeah. And, and the upshot was, to, to my way of thinking, it worked. Now, Joe was talking about day one and we lost. I don't really see it that way because I think the process did force a certain amount of narrowing between the, between, uh, the last best offers. Um, so maybe next time it will be you know, the school boards that, that win, but theoretically the, the process is getting us in a more efficient way to s some kind of narrowing of, of the gaps and then we have finality in you know, having an arbiter just pick. Um, so, as I said, I will um, I will work with Jim, which is actually what we did, what I did with Act 11 with Jen and Damien and Jim. We would have a presentation from the two sides, and then the three of them and I would sit and we would create a draft out of the two proposals, and then have people come in and respond to it. And things that they couldn't live with, we ejected and, and got agreement on all that remained. Um, it, it, my recollection of that yeah. is, is true, absolutely. It could not be more. And going back some time, so Nicole and I, I mean, one of the things we were really concerned about last time was yeah. uh, the timeline. Yeah. So it was a significant challenge then, and it remained so. And that was one of the last changes we made, was to stretch the timeline. We were, so we did stretch it, and I think yeah. that was you know, that was a hard yeah. fought bargain that we reached, and, and I think upsetting that now. And and I can, I can intuit, each side has I would say one, possibly two things that you really want that the other side really doesn't want to give you. I'm, I'm happy to continue those discussions. So I'm, I'm not arbitrarily imposing the idea that you each have the veto on the other. So we, we might, as a committee, wind up importing something in that's not mutually agreed upon if a strong majority of the committee um, agrees on it. So we take you know, four votes to, to do something like that. We did it with V high rebalancing last time out. Um, I, I, it's not my desire to go there, but I, I think the school boards have pointed out some things that are reasonably sensible um, that NEA doesn't want to go along with and vice versa. So we'll, we'll see where the committee lands, but the intention again is to have 98% mutual agreement. Yeah. One more question, I was just looking back at 226 on the top of page two, the language about release time. You guys agreed on the concept of making sure that there was compensation for commissioners, right? But it was not a- Well, they want the state to- That you guys want per, or you want per diem, per diem, not release time? We're looking for them. We're looking for release time. You're our, our for release time difficulty. for teachers. You're looking for per diems for your, for and, your school board And they're members. looking for substitutes to cover the release time for the NEA members. We're not the school they, board. The school board. Oh, the school board. You, uh, oh, you want to be able to ask it. So look, this is one of those things where we, you know, it's imperfect both sides. We try to figure out where we could live with each other. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're looking for release time so our folks can get there. They're looking for per diem compensation for their commissioners. Um, we weren't looking for that, but we agree with that. They should be compensated. It was part of their original deal. Mm -hmm. uh, they'd like our folks to be released, but then the state to pay for their, the substitutes, Mike. And then the state and the yeah, I mean, part of the issue for us, right, is that one of my jobs as a school board member is to make sure that I've got the best qualified teachers sitting in front of my kids every day. Yeah. 
maybe not necessarily in multi-day commission meetings, every time that teacher goes out, it's a cost to the district yeah. and to the taxpayers in that district. It's not a cost that's necessarily being borne by the Vermont NEA to have that teacher there for the day. And, and the two sides are splitting the other costs. So, yeah, I mean, it would be a reasonable starting place to say maybe both sides should be splitting the cost of substitutes to free up a commission member. Um, but remains to be, remains to be argued. Um, I mean, that's the, the council. Yeah. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I, I just. Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to be clear on what's being agreed to. Well, I'm not clear. I'll, I'll, I'll talk with you about that um, later in the day. Okay. Um, and we'll work off of these documents, and then, admittedly, it will be my notes and understanding, and subject to revision by committee members and the and the party, but it will give us a place to start. So yeah, have we talked yet, though, about um, at the beginning we had testimony from uh, Mr. McNeil? Yes, that will be I'm part happy of the commission, but I'm not sure if they agree with that position or not. Do you want that? I'm, I'm clear on okay. it. So when, okay. we, when we talk later, we'll um, lay it out. I don't know if, probably Jim and I can. Thanks, Jim. Um, okay, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. That, I was hoping for something just like this. You it was it perfect. Well, I mean, and we, a, we came to some agreement, and, and agreement. I'll say to yeah. Jim, I mean, we, you know, some of the, the things we think we could get to, yes, the details matter, the words matter, so yeah. that's what we're looking for. Uh, and it, I'll talk to you, Jim. The, the whole VSBA comes forward with one new crowd. I asked Joe yeah. two weeks ago. Uh, and and yeah, some things. Feel, feel free, if you have language around, especially the things you agree on, um, the things you're close on, like the grievance procedures, that's a fairly delicate uh, piece of. I don't know that we're close on. We just think, okay. You think it's the details matter, process. Joe? What you know? What are those details? How do you how do you get yeah. there? Uh, yeah. I can't say yes or no. I just understood. Significant. Okay. Thanks, Thank Jeff. you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Um, so, committee, it's ice cream and social break. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, why don't we come back at three? Is there any ice cream? Or are you just canceling? No, no, no. Okay, oh, good. I know. If there's not, it's Gina, my fault. I know. Yeah. Ow! Because now we blame the committee. She let us down and saved my daughter so many times. <laughs> she tends to get headaches and stomach aches, and so she's always kind of going to the nurses office and laying down so, I appreciate what you're what you're doing um, thank you okay. so let's let's get started we're on uh, the miscellaneous bill and the part of it relating to the provision of menstrual hygiene products so Jeannie yes um, this I'm not sure if you realize we imported this into the miscellaneous bill so then I know that you have to change your is the miscellaneous bill the one that starts with the student site? Yes. So, um, Sophia Hall, please join us. Thank you. If you would like to. Does that mean move or? Uh, the witness chair. Yeah. <laughs> and you can uh, just introduce yourself and your affiliation for the record and, okay. and tell us what we need to hear. Okay. My name is Sophia Hall. I am a uh, the president of the Vermont State School Nurses Association, and we are about 130 members, but we have over 350 nurses, school nurses in the state. Um, I've been a nurse for 40 years, and school nurse in Sheffield at Miller's Run School for the last seven. Um, we truly appreciate your reaching out to us and asking the school nurses for input on this very important um, piece of legislation because for those of us school nurses in the room, <clears throat> although nurses are of more than just female gender, over 50% of the people in our world are female who menstruate once a month for 40 plus years. And making that a normal thing is what's really important to us as nurses using the opportunity to educate not only the girls, but the boys as well, that this is a very normal activity. And um, it, we feel that it's very important that 
uh, sanitary supplies be made available at no cost for the students. Um, Can I just ask you, um, because we haven't really heard it articulated expressly, but there are some people who are of the opinion that it's enough if we have supplies available in the nurse's office. We don't need to provide them in bathrooms from dispensers. What, what would be your take on that? Well, it's interesting. Um, I have three um, additional school nurses with me. We got together over the weekend to talk about um, how to present this information. And um, every school is different, just like every child is different. Every school has its own little climate. And we feel pretty strongly that it's important that the schools be allowed to determine which bathrooms mm -hmm. um, need to have the supplies available. Um, we want them to continue to be available in the nurse's office. But again, it's a normal activity, so you shouldn't have to always go to the nurse when you need a tampon. Right. Yes, we want people to be responsible and um, independent and be prepared, but the reality is that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. Even if you've been menstruating for years, you can get caught off guard so with, and not be prepared. So it's important to have them available, but the, um, the schools, the people in the schools that mm -hmm. need to decide what's going to work best for our school, for our population. Well, let me ask you this, um, because Wuro was engaged in this um, trying to you know, read the future, because you always have some uh, outliers, some districts that would say, well, what's right in our school is to have them only in the nurse's office or to have them only in one bathroom, whatever is the, the cheapest or the least trouble. Or, so how might we find a medium between requiring that these be provided and allowing the freedom you're talking about for the individual school to determine what's best for it? That's a great question. And because I'm in an elementary school, mm -hmm. elementary middle school that's relatively small, I'm going to ask one of my folks that are in a much larger school. OK. Um, so um, and if you could just identify yourself for the record. Oh, my name is Catherine Duprat. I'm a nurse at Harwood. Um, I've been a high school nurse uh, for about four years. And I've worked in elementaries as well. So I think there's also some embarrassment about having to go to a nurse, to a female, to ask. Um, and it shouldn't be up to somebody else to decide whether or not you can have this product, whether or not you've had too much of this product. Um, there's cultural sensitivity where it's embarrassing to ask another person to, in front of, sometimes there's boys in the room, to have to say that in front of your peers. Um, so I think it, gives a lot of autonomy and um, saves dignity and um, you know and also with students we do not let students have bloody noses in class and bleed in class they come to the nurse's office and we give them supplies to take care of that we don't question it mm -hmm. we don't talk about whether it's in our budget to do this and um, we provide these supplies and I think the resource kids are still going to use their own products because probably what we're going to provide is um, less expensive products that are not, you know, cardboard applicator. Not all girls are going to want to use a cardboard applicator. They're going to want the slim plastic applicator. So the resource kids are still going to use that. So I don't think you're going to find every single female student um, using these products. They have delayed dispensers so that you're not, you know, taking a whole bunch at a time. It's going to take energy. So it's not going to be, um, you know, there's ways around it. And then for non-identifying females who also um, menstruate, having them in other bathrooms and not just girls' bathrooms, keeping that language vague is important. Mm -hmm. So I know you're in high school too. Do you have any other thoughts? Yeah, no, I agree with everything you said. And also, you know, just. And again, if you just. Oh, sure. I'm Kelly Landwehr, and I'm a school nurse at Middlebury High School. The, the reason why we do that, by the way, is sometimes a year later or two years later, we need to go back and find out what the testimony actually was. Mm -hmm. And at that point, if you haven't said your name, mm -hmm. 
you know, we have a very difficult time. Sure. Yeah, but I think looking at the way the bill currently reads, it says an all bathroom, all female and gender neutral bathrooms. And I think that where it gets back to where so spoke to schools are all different. So it may not work to have it in every bathroom. There may be reasons why it's not appropriate to have it in every single one of those bathrooms. So giving schools, having the wording be a little more vague and giving schools the option to have it in bathrooms they think is appropriate. But I also agree that there needs to be not only a supply in the health office, but that supply that you can access without having to ask, without having to deal with maybe the shyness, the embarrassment around asking. So having it worded some way that there's some publicly available and some available in the health office. Yeah, that's the tricky part. It's it is tricky. The, yeah. the way the bill does it now, it, it just draws a bright line. Every, mm -hmm. every bathroom for um, women or gender neutral bathroom has to have it. Um, and that way, there's never the problem you described. The, the person would always have access. But to go back to the point about the autonomy of the school district and the, the fact that the administrators of it know it best, um, it would be great to allow some flexibility. It's just, you know, if you leave a loophole, sometimes people will drive a truck through it. So what we're, what we're trying to do is make sure that people don't continue to disadvantage women as they have traditionally. And it can happen so easily if we, if we say, for instance, you can provide them in the nurse's office, but you have to provide them in a certain number of bathrooms. They might decide that number is one. And then, you know, does that really help? Um, well, thank you all for coming. I actually, when we first talked about this bill, said we should reach out to school nurses. And Kelly, it's great to see you here. I'm Ruth Hardy, and my daughter is in your school. And I, the first person I called actually about this bill was Mary Gill. So, um, and uh, she connected me to your organization. Great. Um, and I talked to the Mary Hogan nurse also. But. Um, so um, in talking to my daughter, who is a high school student, she was absolutely, you know, thought that these should be available in bathrooms so that she wouldn't have to go ask you for one if she needed them. Um, to your point, I think that girls have their own preferences on what kind of product they're going to use, and so people won't always use them, but they're there for an emergency situation where they might not have one in their purse or the backpack or whatever. Um, so I think as a mom of teenage girls and a woman who's been through all of this, I think it's super important that we have them available in the place of use um, and maybe providing some flexibility, but not enough for to drive a you know truck through. Um, but I wanted to ask you, since you're an elementary school nurse, one of the things we were talking about right now is that the bill was originally drafted just as high schools, and I think we're all in agreement that we should just add middle schools. Right. But I'm cu curious about if you think we should just say schools in general, or if we, there's some grade oh, level, or how, how should we treat we elementary schools? We wrote this up, and we yeah. specifically identified that, that it's, it's not just um, high school. High school, yeah, because Menarche may not begin, may, may begin as early as eight, which is um, elementary school, essentially, right. mm -hmm. um, and may not start until someone is 18 or 19 years old, which is much later than high school. So we don't want to limit it. We would encourage you not to limit it to just high school, because mm -hmm. yeah. if we're going to make them available to the girls, they need to be available whatever yeah. school they're in. Um, so that's actually a very good point. Yeah. Um, so I don't have the real answer for how to make it vague enough that it's available and there's some autonomy with the school, um, but some direction to make mm -hmm. sure that it's not just in the nurse's office. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Sorry, I'm Becca McCray, and I am the middle school nurse at Edmonds Middle School in Burlington. Um, and my thought on that question is we have a lot of data about free and reduced lunch and we know that this particular um, uh, period poverty does affect that population. Um, and so maybe having some sort of ratio if, you're, if your school has so whatever percentage of free and reduced lunch you get so many, you have to provide so many product um, and making it a ratio of that nature. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's mm -hmm. plausible, but yeah, it's an idea. <laughs> and I think the, 
you know, it could be something as simple as you have to provide it in the majority of your bathrooms for women and uh, gender neutral, um, which would allow for, you know, saying we don't need it here, we don't need it here, but we still have to hit most of, of the bathrooms available to these um, young women. So that's a possibility. I, I think it's a good um, thing to keep in mind that uh, there's a socioeconomic mm -hmm. factor to it that we should be taking into account. I think the other thing is, is when you say that you have to supply all the bathrooms, my my building has many bathrooms, mm -hmm. and so the budget. When you look at the budget factor right now, the budget uh, comes out of the nurses' budget, and it's just whatever I supply with whatever budget I can. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're looking at a school that has many bathrooms, they have to put more into that than a school that only has one bathroom, yeah. for example. And so I think it really depends on the school's population and the um, poverty level of the school, um, as well as how many bathrooms they have. Mm -hmm. We also talked a little, a little bit about should it be the school district's responsibility, should it not be a state responsibility? to provide financially? Oh, I, I think it's the district's responsibility, in the same way that it is for normal, uh, you know, any, any kind of supply that, mm -hmm. that the district needs. So we've been trying to point out that there's very little difference between toilet tissue and, right. and this product, mm -hmm. so the state doesn't get involved in um, paying for other supplies. But I think we have heard that the, there is concerns on the part of the school boards that the dispensers and these products do represent a cost. They want us to keep that in mind. I think the dispensers would be a one-time cost, or you know, one time every 15 years or whatever. Um, they tend to be pretty durable and low-tech. So unless they get vandalized, I think you can assume that they're going to be useful over a long life and you know I just don't think the expense overall is gonna drain anybody's budget whereas now it is draining some nurses budgets right. Uh, right. which is not right this is gonna sound kind of funny but um, it's not meant to be mm -hmm. I don't know how many women's bathrooms you've been in with the dispensers just we went into the bathroom upstairs there's a dispenser in there that's Empty. Okay. It's empty. Yeah. So the, the supplies are on top of that. I see. Um, many of these dispensers are, I see all the ladies nodding. I guess it wasn't, <laughs> I guess it wasn't so funny. So funny. Um, many of these dispensers are designed by a company for their product. Right. So we don't want to get anybody stuck into, sure, we can give you a free dispenser, but now the only thing that's going to fit in it yeah. is our product. Yeah. Because well, and again, those decisions would be individual school boards. Exactly. That's, yeah. We would prefer, yeah. 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 Um, I have a thought about bathrooms. Is when I think about how schools are designed, a lot of times we have a middle school in with a high school, or we have uh, first and second grade wing, kindergarten wing, five and six. So when I think about accessibility, I wouldn't want a younger student in a middle school to have to go to the high school to mm -hmm. get product. So um, I don't know if there needs to be language around, you know, that type of thinking. I don't know what it would be, but it just came to my head. Well, I think we've, we've generally been in agreement that we would stretch it to middle schools. I think the, the question that's still on the table is, should we be trying to hit the sixth, fifth and sixth graders who might conceivably um, be in, in need? And I think if we're normalizing it, we don't want fifth and sixth grade uh, young women who start to menstruate to feel embarrassed. We want them to know, okay, this is expected to happen. Or it might happen for you, it may not happen for you. And there could be signage with it so that they know how to use it, they can. But if you don't know how to use it, the school nurse is available. This is where you go to ask questions, to get accurate answers and that sort of thing. So I'm a big proponent of making sure that fifth and sixth graders have Yes. But I would also add that if we're normalizing it for the rare third grader who gets their period, 
to have those products available in an elementary setting in a normal way, they're not gonna feel like they're an abnormal statistic or mm -hmm. that this is happening to them and no one else. So I, I do think when we talk about normalizing, it really does need to be in yeah. all schools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, um, so we've heard from everybody with only one person in the witness chair. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Is, is there anybody we haven't um, heard from on um, this Hi. issue? Uh, yes, no, we're, we're uh, coming to you, I mean, uh, of the school nurses. Put you on the hot spot. Right up there. I'm sorry. Can we ask the? Oh yeah, sure. Nurses so, about this as well. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, you probably haven't had a chance to look at this language because I think you were just invited in to talk about menstrual products. Um, just fun, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're comfortable with it. Yeah. Me too. You know, we all do it. Um, but. Uh, that we, in this miscellaneous bill that has the language on the menstrual products um, in schools is also some language about school wellness policies. Mm -hmm. I, Kelly, you may have been involved with Mary on doing the one in the ACSD. Yeah, I know. we wrote it, yeah, it was it, part of it. Exactly, and so we have some language that was brought to us um, by the American Heart Association regarding uh, AOE creating a model wellness policy um, and using this kind of measurement and um, framework that they're recommending. And since you're here, I'm wondering if one of you or all of you could take a look at the language and, and let us know what you think. So we well, did, did you look at, at it? Well, so, we looked at yeah. it ahead of time, but we weren't quite sure about it. We weren't like, we wanted to ask you what your time frame was and if we could take longer yeah. to look at it. We also have other nurses that probably know that more than us four. Okay. Um, that might be more of a better fit to speak yeah. to that. Um, That's fine, I just think you're a relevant, you are a relevant group of people to hear from on a wellness policy Thank for schools. So. Thank you. We appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. And, um, is that the updated? I don't know. It's in yellow. On it, is this. it is it the is updated, updated language. Okay. Yeah. So this um, this tool that they're recommending, this rubric, um, is I, I think supposed to be better than the one they first suggested. This one has a broader definition of well-being and um, and health, so it includes a mental health piece. And, but un understood that you didn't. Prepared to yeah. Testify on that. But we do have a school nurse who is very involved and interested in that, and he specifically said, "If you talk about this, I'd love to comment on it." Okay. So um, I'm not sure what your time frame is, but we could we, give you his we, contact we, information. We certainly have another week or two. Okay. Before, okay. Um, so if he wants to, um, so you, you have the language shared with you via email. Mm -hmm. If you want to just pass it to him, sure. he can either write us testimony and send it to Jeannie and it'll get okay. to us, or he's welcome to come and, and speak to it in person, whichever he prefers. Okay. And Kelly, I'd be really interested, since you just went through this process, yeah, if what you think of this. Look, and I could do the same, I could send something yeah. that would work. Or you and Mary, or maybe. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. And um, Stephanie. Um, Vermont Medical Society also wanted to speak to this bill. Thank you. Although these lovely ladies already said most, of, I'm going to be very short. Most of what I already um, wanted to say. But so Stephanie Winters with the Vermont Medical Society, also with the American Academy of Pediatrics, Vermont chapter, um, and also representing today um, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in Vermont, who actually brought this bill to my attention. This bill was passed in New Hampshire last year, so we have a, a little bit of a competition in my eyes that we should have passed this um, first. So supporting this bill um, wholeheartedly, um, you know, the, the reasons that uh, we are fully supportive of this is that this uh, bill will provide equal access uh, to all students regardless of their socioeconomic status. Um, menstrual products are necessities, not luxuries. 
uh, and having products available in the restrooms, you really, you talked about how, having them in the nurse's office versus the restrooms, and we do feel pretty strongly that they do need to be available outside of the nurse's office. Um, it's more of a, it makes, um, it makes menstruation more normal, judgment-free, reduces stigma. Um, you know, there's just a number of reasons. Having them in the nurse's office is also important as well, but having them outside would be really important. Um, and so I would just say that we, um, we support expanding to secondary schools, certainly um, to elementary schools as well. I think we just want to make sure that these products are available um, statewide. So, and we thank uh, Senator Lyons for, for introducing this bill. Nice. Any questions for Stephanie Winters? Thank you, Stephanie. Appreciate it. Um, is there anybody else who wants to speak to this bill? I just had a question. Yes. Um, uh, Jeff Francis from the Superintendents Association. I, I appreciate the um, level of interest that's exhibited here, the support. I've had occasion to work with some of these nurses, which is I found delightful because they're experts. As you try to navigate toward conclusion, and this is just a concept, it's not a recommendation, what about language that says availability in a majority of bathrooms in accordance with a plan developed in consultation with the school nurse? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking similar. So yeah, similar. that sounds good. Because yeah. that way, rip that up and hand it to Jim. Yeah, I mean you get. <laughs> <laughs> does it say? Does it say all schools? Because I think it's really important. Well, I think so. You know, it's, it's, I'm I'm a learner, right? The all schools piece. Like, and I forgive the detail that we pursue this with, but you have K1, K2 schools, right? So I'm not sure about the, the, if this is a, I don't know whether this is a student focused bill or not, but if you're talking about student bathrooms, I think that the majority, minority, what number of bathrooms is something that the school nurses are probably best well equipped to advise on. So I wouldn't, I would not, I would, and you, you know, you, um, I wouldn't want to see a school administration and nurse trying to figure out how to work, figure out a workaround on majority and availability in a school where that didn't make sense. So I don't know what the line of demarcation is with regard to a majority of bathrooms. But I'd like to think that common sense would prevail and the nurses who I found to be extraordinarily practical in the way they approach their work would be able to advise on that. But I also appreciate the committee's interest in not wanting to um, address the, the, the matter insufficiently. Yeah. So I, I don't know what, I don't yeah. know how to respond to that. I mean, it's a good point. Now. I don't think K through two, we really need to, um, but in, in a school where you have a mix that includes fifth and sixth graders, then, then I think you need to. Yeah, me too. And I don't know whether they would say that that was, I would, I would defer to them in terms yeah. of what, you know, majority or not, so. Okay. All right, well. Um, we might actually want to, although I hate to suggest this, but have like a legislative intent or something, a um, couple of sentences, mm -hmm. just to make sure that, you know, that, they can they can carry it out the way they want to, but this is what we want. You know, right. This is what right. we're trying to achieve. Yeah, I don't think that's a bad idea. Just to state what we've said a number of times, which is the idea is to make it a, a normal part of school life. Mm -hmm. um, and we that, even have findings that say we find that women menstruate, <laughs> 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 and, and therefore that'll make the new national <laughs> news. <laughs> Okay. I have one other question. Yeah, sure. Um, in terms of public, private, parochial, are we talking about all schools or just public schools? That's a good and one. has anybody thought about that? It's always the sixty-four thousand dollar question because in Vermont we have a segment of schools that are called approved independent schools, where you can tuition your kid to that school. So public money is following them. They tend, you know, in some ways to be. Um, left outside of the regulations that generally govern public schools. 
but in a case like this, I don't I don't see a reason why they should be left out of this this bill um, because we're talking about thousands of Vermont students. So um, well, those I would be all for it. also have school nurses. So yeah. I would like if that language would make sense in yeah. any type of school. Yeah, I would be all for including um, approved independence under this language. That's just a step we have to make sure we um, cover with the witnesses. Jeannie? Yes. Could you ask um, Mill Moore uh, if he would like to testify or um, can give us the names of current lobbyists for approved independent schools to speak to this bill? You have Mill's contact info, right? OK. And then we can do that the next time you take it up. Great question. Can I ask if all schools have a school nurse? Ooh, we would love to talk to you about that. Well, I'm not sure. That's a bigger talk. Because the answer is no. Okay. No, they don't. So, and so some have a part-time school It would have nurse. to be in the school district that you would refer to, not the individual school. Well, not the wellness, there's a wellness committee, right? Not in every case. No. Yeah. Jeff Francis Superintendent Association. That's a good question. Even though not every school has a school nurse, there's a school nurse associated with every school, mm -hmm. even if it, there's not. So when you get to the notion of consultation, correct me if I'm wrong, You're there right. would be a school nurse available for consulting on the, yes. the, 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 the plan. Yes. Yeah. At, the, at the SU level or at the district level? You could put SU, yeah. but the school quality standards still have a ratio of nurse to students. Yes. One of the reasons not why... It's not always a, a, a relevant. SU's not relevant. Not SU's always. SU and SD are used synonymously yeah. in the law. Oh, but, yeah, but the <laughs> school quality standards still have a ratio requirement. But, if I may, you, you're what they wanted to talk to you about is that in some instances you're reduced to not part week, part day nurses mm -hmm. in certain schools because of that ratio. Mm -hmm. And the ratio looks at numbers, it does not look at. Um, acuity. acuity of the students and the requirements of mm -hmm. the help that's there. So, just another big topic on a national level. So, my first nurse job was a half day a week at Lincoln. <clears throat> um, that's all they got is a half day. So, how would I be able to educate? How did they realize they have access to a nurse? I mean, so that is just to put that out there. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, this is the, the Joy and the problem of Vermont schools right. is everybody's different. Some are so tiny and they're getting by on a shoestring. On the other hand, we graduate record numbers of kids from high school at least, partially because of that kind of craft brood yes. um, philosophy. So double edge. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, thank you all. I really appreciate you making thank the trip. You. And hopefully you'll be pleased with the final product. Um, we will take your advice and Jeff's advice and make some changes to the language. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure if you had a chance to read what we wrote. I have not. Um, I would encourage you to do that. Okay. There's not a whole lot different in there, but we've expounded a little bit on some of the um, rationale. Yeah. Good enough. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank I tend to use you. things like this when I present something on the floor. When I go to talk to the other senators on the floor about it, I pull these out then the night before and steal some of your language for my oh, presentations. Hopefully you'll steal some of our language for them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank uh, you. Very sure. Much. Thanks. I do want to say this. I was just painfully. Painfully. Jeannie and I have been working okay. with this because her system is like completely. It's not my system, please. <laughs> well, I just the system she it. has to right. oh, yeah. interface with with is very opposite does not lend itself and to does not want to be modified. I see. Hey, uh, and, and it's what happened in Iowa. <laughs> so this, maybe in another hour and a half they'll tell us. Maybe they will. Um, so um, yeah. we're done for today then. And tomorrow we'll get back to, um, I want to do, hopefully Jim and I maybe can have a draft of that public school um, health care benefits? Uh, maybe. I think it's, it's hard, but we'll maybe. If, if we can, then we can talk about that. Um, 
we will uh, discuss the library bill tomorrow. I'm not sure if we'll um, mark it up and vote, but, but we'll have a discussion. And maybe I may have another item to add to that agenda tomorrow. Okay. Wait, wait, can I just ask you when, what's your timeline on the leading study? I know you talked about it a little bit. So I'm, I'm meeting tomorrow with um, Chloe from JFO, and I want to see what she's um, done for me in terms of creating this phase-in. Mm -hmm. And so assuming that she's created something that's usable, understandable, that looks um, the way I want it to look, because you know how it is. Something like this, you put it out on the table, it gets into a new story, the headline, picks up on one little piece of it and poisons the well. So I'm trying to be careful in terms of what actually goes out. So there are simulations in the study itself, but whatever we put on the table is going to be pretty quickly picked up. And it's, it's a little bit um, of a potential flashpoint, obviously, because of the different communities and how they'll fare under the new formula. So assuming that it looks good tomorrow, then my intention would be by the end of the week, maybe Friday, we take a chunk of the time um, and talk about this phased idea of the, of the waiting proposal, have a general discussion about the waiting study itself, what people feel like the results of it were, how accurate do they feel they are. With Chloe here. With Chloe here. And to what extent do people feel motivated to, to act on it now? Because they're, they're, you know, in the House, for instance, there are committees that are giving every signal they don't feel there's any reason to act on it now. I don't agree with that myself, but I don't want to prejudge where people on the committee fall. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, and then also, we discussed a little bit in caucus the school construction stuff. Yeah. And my impression about what they were doing, whatever it is, over in the house, was <laughs> somewhere in this building. Um, I'm actually, it's unclear to me how much they're actually doing on this issue. Um, and it's a couple committees that are looking at it. I think yeah. it's their, whatever, institution. My intention was to let them go first. OK. That going back to my initial discussions with Kate about this year, she wanted to pick that up. Um, okay. I think that makes sense because their Ways and Means Committee in particular, but also their Appropriations Committee, are much rockier shoals than ours. Mm -hmm. They kill bills over their routine. Yeah, I think it was their Ways and Means that was looking at it and their education. Because right. I had a meeting yesterday with my superintendents in my district, and mm -hmm. they, you know, we, we were sort of talking about the big picture things and this came up as one of those things where I, I'm hearing from them that they would like more state oversight and guidance in this area yeah. because it is so completely uh, it, it's another big equity issue that there are districts that are able to pass these large bonds and then there are districts that struggle and struggle and yeah. struggle and, and, and the ones that do pass the large bonds are doing it on the backs of taxpayers exactly so it's raising everybody's costs and and having some kind of, as we talked about in caucus, some kind of priority um, list. or it, yeah. And the AOE doesn't even have a staff who does this kind of thing. So wondering if, if the House doesn't go forward with anything, if there's any way we could put something at least to get yep. a study or something in on the books that we could start this conversation, because it's a multi-year kind of thing. Well, we have our miscellaneous bill. Yeah. And so even if they don't put out a miscellaneous bill, our miscellaneous bill will come back to us. So we will have a chance. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, there's nothing in it that's, um, that's going to cause them to, to hold it up, I don't think. So we would have, theoretically, a chance at the end, at least one bite more at the end, to put on a piece of language. They would be in full agreement, whatever it is, that is the, the education committee. Um, but. I'm, I'm confident they'll do something on it, some, okay. some piece of language at least, uh, because they've been taking testimony since last year. They, right. they took a lot of testimony last year. 
from facilities managers. Right. Because it's not only just construction, which I think yeah. the moratorium was on new construction building, like a new mm. school building, but there are all this deferred maintenance. It's deferred maintenance that's killing schools at this point. Yeah, and, and you know, people are doing it anyway. Like Burlington bonded for seventy million. South Burlington's asking for two hundred and nine million. Um, so as I said in caucus, I think it's better for the state to have a seat at the table where the state is working with these kinds of requests and maybe, you know, has some say in spreading them out or we'll help you this year, we'll help you that year. Um, as opposed to now, it's just people don't get any help at all, so they just do whatever they, they want. Well, well they do whatever their taxpayers will, will approve right. because, I mean, I have one district in my Senate district that has, I think, three, four times gone out for a bond for a high school that is falling apart. I mean, it's, it's really bad. And the, it's failed every time. And so they, then they see the Chittenden County right. districts pass these big bonds, and they're like, <laughs> Why can't that be us? Can't we even get a tiny slice of that yeah. that money? So, and yet their tax rates are going up. So it's it's causing equity issues around the state. And I agree. And so having, I just like. And to, I, I think you could write a very short form bill where you task AOE with developing, you know, not ten pages of rules about it, but very quick, understandable criteria on which projects we're prioritizing and why. So, for instance, if a school is in danger of losing their accreditation because of the physical plant of the building, then we help, you know? Or if you were a newly merged district and you needed a new building because you're putting all the kids into one building, maybe that's a situation that triggers um, help with bonding. Um, but they should be able to develop uh, a quick rubric for something that would sift, because there'll be a lot of requests, hundreds of requests. Could you sift it down so that every year there are five that, that rise to the top? And we, it's not like we'd be, we'd be helping the vast majority, but we would be back in the business of, under certain circumstances, helping people with their construction projects. I almost, when we were doing Act 46 and Shaman was governor, I almost had them convinced to have the state step in. If you voluntarily went along with Act 46 and you needed a new high school and your high school was uh, at a certain advanced age, then the state would step in. And the Shaman people were really serious for a while about you know so many millions of dollars of bonding capability that they would use to leverage this larger set of bonds, and then they pulled back at the last minute because it was, I mean, basically for the same reason Beth Pierce is yeah. um, not signing off to the housing bond, too. Yeah. All right. I just want to make sure we have a chance to address yeah. it a little. Yeah. Thanks. Um, do we have any appetite? Uh, to look more at the yeah. universal breakfast and uh, lunch. So here's my issue with that. Yeah. I think if we send that, you've got Bobby on appropriations, mm -hmm. and, and he will he will be actively pushing for it. I I think maybe it might have a chance, but certainly nothing else that we send them would get funded. You know what I mean? So. Um, Does the yeah you know, the tuition the tuition is all out of the end? No, the tu well, is it the we haven't decided. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it, it, it's just from the end. You know, it doesn't affect the general fund. It actually takes money out of the general fund. But I did speak with Jane about it. Um, Which about the tuition free bill? Yeah, I just had a conversation. Yeah, with her, so. she was she was very adamant that there had to be a fund. Yeah, but she was. She told me she would think about it. So. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I, I mean, she, she basically said that, but she. Yeah. Anyway, you and I can talk it later. But um, uh, the universal schools bill
Yeah. It's I'm, too much. It's, it's, it would be really hard for my districts. And yeah. if they would cut teachers in order to do it. They would, I mean, I talked to them yesterday. They were really against it. Well, the, the estimate went up $20 million. Yeah, I mean, it's like $40 about, million. Dollars. It's crazy. We, have, we haven't actually done that. No, I understand. I mean, that's but, not actually been on the record. But, but Ted made clear that AOE was going to come in with a projection that was $50 million. And we had initially heard 20 million. So I, I agree with Ruth. I think it's uh, it's just the sort of thing that would it would commit us to a massive expenditure. And I just can't see any of the stuff that we've worked on as a committee overcoming that. You know, if, if they did decide to do this, the school lunch bill after school and the free college bill up, I can't see how. We are doing the the lunch local foods incentive school meals bill in Ag. We took a lot of testimony on it this morning. Um, the percentage of local sources. Yeah, the percentage, yeah. which is a much cheaper bill. Um, and yeah. I think that we can get Bobby on board with that one, so he can, you know, then he'll be on board with an Ag bill, not mm -hmm. an Ed bill, even though it is money mm -hmm. for schools, and that we can take some provisions. I'm still committed to. So what, one thing that we can do, I, my sense is that the votes are not on the committee to pass out um, universal free lunch bill. Do we have that? Or is that Bobby? No, we, we, have, we have, have it. Um, yeah. yeah, I was going to say if, if Bobby had it, we could just remain silent on it and let Ag do with it what they could. Um, but yeah, I, I can't see passing it out. Um, how do you feel about it, Jim? I don't know. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Just I was always concerned about the money. Yeah. Where that's coming from. I always thought it should come within the scope of the money that they get now, but mm -hmm. it's climbing like that. It's just at the expense of another twenty million or more. And yeah. it's not just how many times can you cut the pie, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we, we don't have to decide right now, but it seems like that's kind of where we are on, on that. Um, but the, the local sourcing, we better quality. Yeah, we don't need to see that bill in here. Do we? Unless we want to. I mean, if we want to use it as a vehicle for something else, we could, I, you, would, you could ask Bobby and yeah. take it in here. But I think that I mean, we're having AOE um, testify mm -hmm. on it all the usual suspects. You should have seen our room this morning. Maybe you could just bring it in, um, you know, ask Jeannie if she can make copies, and we could just do a drive by one day, just a quick look, so we can say we ran our eye over it. Yeah, we are getting testimony from AOE on Thursday, and then I think we'll probably make changes, and then maybe we can bring it in next yes. week. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay, thanks. I'll be in. And Jimmy, you want to go to your first?